John Layton was an overnight sensation after his record Johnny Remember Me topped the charts for seven weeks in 1961. For three years he caused mass fan hysteria before giving it all up to be an actor, making some classic movies alongside some of Hollywood's finest stars. Johnny Remember Me John Layton was the first television actor to make his name as a singer when he became an overnight star after performing Johnny Remember Me on one of television's earliest soap series. Middle class and public school educated, he always remained uncomfortable with his pop star persona amongst the ragamuffin rock and rollers, despite causing mass fan hysteria. Would-be Rolling Stone Bill Wyman never forgot watching that television show. I loved that record. I saw that on my grand's TV because we didn't have one. We were still on gas at our house and gas lightings. We didn't have electricity. Uh, and I saw that and I immediately went out and bought it. So um, I really liked that. It was great. It was never an intention to be a singer or a pop singer. It was always my intention to be an actor. Uh, from a very early age. Um, in fact, my mother was uh, on the stage, and uh, my father, I think they were referred to in those days as stage door Johnnies. Uh, <laughs> it all started in Frinton, on the East Coast. Frinton's a long time ago, but I remember quite distinctly in those um, early days, 43, 42, the German bombers used to come across to bomb London and invariably they wouldn't have enough fuel so they'd drop their bombs in Frinton and all around the East Coast. A Nazi formation of bombers going home in a hurry is attacked by a single hurricane. Many times you remember as a tiny child standing in the garden at Frinton watching these dogfights in the air. Leighton's parents split up when he was six and he was shunted around between family, prep and public schools before ending up in London's posh private Highgate school. I found myself sort of staying at school quite often during the, the holidays, um, which is kind of sad looking back really, but I didn't really mind at the time. When I left Highgate, I, I went straight into uh, drama school and then to the Theatre Royal York. A happy days, I was up there for nearly a year. And it's a wonderful training ground because you get to play different characters every week, you learn lots of plays, and you're doing it professionally in front of an audience who are paying to see you. I came back to London to find an agent. I, di I didn't have an agent. I'm telling you something, there's nothing at the moment. Yeah, no, there's nothing today for you. Nothing today. The sun is shining. John's luck was about to change, and he chanced upon future management mogul Robert Stigwood, who'd just hitchhiked from Australia, hoping to make fame and fortune. Signing Leighton kick-started a career which was to embrace the Bee Gees, Eric Clapton, and West End Smashes, Jesus Christ Superstar, Hair and Grease. The world is buzzing to Suddenly there I was, a contract artist with an agent, big time, right? And then uh, he put me up for a role in a series called Biggles. Hey, that's the place. Some screwy-looking building for the back of the house. Well, let's get on. And then I was doing television. It all happened quite quickly. How much longer do we play robbers instead of cops? I don't know, Ginger. Let's hope our friends at the barn haven't lost interest in us. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure we were followed back here from the barn. There's a chap on Charing Cross Road seemed to be keeping pace with us. I saw his reflection a couple of times in shop windows. Did you notice the bloke behind him? What? One of Gaskin's boys, I hope. 
<laughs> I felt like the Pied Piper of Hamelin. <laughs> I remember one day Robert Stigwood said, can you sing? And um, I said, well, I suppose I can. I know I'm very good in the bathroom. Come on and fly with me Up in the sky with me Like birds upon the wing Another of Stigwood's signings was Mike Sarn, later to have a number one hit with Come Outside, featuring now famous East Ender Wendy Richards. Back then, he was just another struggling actor. Come outside. Stigwood's idea was that if, it, if I use actors who can sing, um, I'm on a better wicket than singers who can act. Stigwood put John together with another young Australian, arranger Charles Blackwell, and one of pop music's premier record producers, Joe Meek. Their first effort together was Tell Laura I Love Her. Tell Laura I Love Her. I sang a couple of songs there, and um, Joe Meek sort of messed around with various knobs and things and uh, played it back, and I must say I was quite uh, amazed at what I heard. That cannot wait. He could do amazing things in, in those days, and uh, I actually had to ask if it was me. I said, Are you sure that's me? <laughs> he was the youngest driver there. The crowd Joseph Lockwood's Columbia label had the hit record of Tell Laura. He'd brought out the independent top rank label, which had released John Layton's version, and stifled it, although many regarded John's the best. How his car overturned in flames. They threw mine in the bin and their version went to number one. It wasn't a particularly good start to my so-called recording career. However, Robert Stigwood wasn't about to give up on his idea that John Layton, actor, should be a top pop star. Another song was found, Johnny Remember Me, and he was sent back in the studio with Charles Blackwell. I used to coach him on the piano and... Um... We tried to work out different songs for him. And then it happened that uh, Jeff Goddard came up with a song called Johnny Remember Me, which we recorded with John. When Johnny Remember Me came along, it was decided that, you know, it was time for another death disc. And the original lyric of Johnny Remember Me is when the mists are rising and the rain is falling and the wind is blowing cold across the moor, I hear the voice of my darling the girl I loved, who died a year ago. And that's how it was originally recorded. And the BBC heard it, they liked the song, but they didn't like the fact that she died. So I had to go back in the studio and re-record it to the girl I loved and lost a year ago. The girl I loved and lost a year ago. It sounded different. And everybody that heard it said, wow, that really is a, a, a different sound. The sound was created in Joe Meek's studio, his flat above a leather shop in London's Holloway Road. Joe Meek was a very strange little man. He lived in this dark, dismal, dirty, smelly place. It was like his version of Dracula's castle or something like that. It was very dark and, um, and strange and weird, but these marvellous sounds came out of it, these great echoey sounds, and he was the only person who could do that. I'd never been in a recording studio anyway, so um, I didn't really know what it should be like. But uh, I thought it was pretty bizarre at the time. Two musicians who worked on that recording were ace drummer Clem Catini of the Tornadoes and young bass player Chaz Hodges, later to find fame as half of Chaz and Dave. We were in his, like, uh, in his living room, I suppose. A girl singer was downstairs somewhere. Johnny, remember me? Never ever saw her. And the violins were somewhere else in the building. I think John Layton, he, he overdubbed his voice, I think. Well, we go and put the backing track down, what was ever needed, like the backing track. And John would come in and uh, with um, Charles Blackwell, who would sort of coach him uh, doing the vocal stuff, you know. So he put the voice on afterwards, you know. Joe used to jump from machine to machine. So I think it was easy for John in that respect that he didn't have to actually sing on the session, you know. I just went in there and sang and said thank you very much and, and walked out again. But uh, the end result 
uh, was particularly with Johnny Remember Me, I, I think was very unique and very advanced. Despite the recording sessions, John Layton primarily considered himself an actor. However, the two roles fatefully collided when he was cast as pop star Johnny Sincere in television's Harper's West One about life in a London department store. Having a record in the can was about to change his life. How are you, Mr. General? How are you? I believe it was Robert Stigwood who suggested that the character Johnny Sincere sung his latest recording when he opened up the record department. You all right, Johnny? Sure, I'm all right. Just a minute. When the birds come in, turn it on pretty strong, but not too strong. I don't want you overdoing it, but you know what to do, you know what I mean? I know what I'm doing. Of course you do. Just remember, we're here to make money. Am I complaining? I played the role of Johnny Sincere, and I sang Johnny Remember Me on the show. <laughs> The following day, every record shop in the country almost was inundated with requests for Johnny Remember Me. And it went to number one. So it did have a unique promotion. I was absolutely astonished because it all happened so quickly. And there I am, sitting at number one. I remember being ushered into EMI Studios to see Sir Joseph Lockwood and his fellow directors, and uh, <clears throat> they started discussing my career as a singer. There was a pause in the conversation, and I, I, and I said, excuse me, sir, but, you know, I appreciate, and I'm very flattered that you should be sort of discussing this, but um, I said, I'm, I'm actually not a singer, I'm an actor, and uh, if you want me to sing, perhaps it might be advisable if I took lessons. And uh, there was a sort of pregnant pause, and Sir Joseph Lockwood leant forward and he said, my dear boy, he said, um, he said, we don't want you to learn how to sing. He said, if you learn how to sing, <laughs> we'll never sell another record. We don't want trained singers. We want what you've got. EMI's head, Sir Joseph Lockwood, was one of a group that controlled the music industry. Homosexuality was still illegal, so it was largely unspoken, but they shared a common interest in the young brill creamed idols. There was a gay fraternity, but it's the point is we didn't know it was a gay fraternity. Joe Meek, Robert Stigwood, Larry Pons, Joe Lockwood, and a few others were, were part of a fraternity uh, who were sort of promoting young boys and trying to uh, make them... But I suppose it needed their enthusiasm to get this pop thing on, you know, get it going. The live show was an essential component for success as a top pop star. Johnny Remember Me was quickly followed by another smash, Wild Wind, which also topped the charts and earned him a silver disc for its sales. I was asked to go on television and sing both songs with the Billy Cotton band, and Billy Cotton himself presented me with the silver discs on television. Well, that really was an ordeal, I mean, singing with a big band. Topping the charts and with fans clamouring for live shows, John was forced to tour the country with other rockers on packaged road tours. It wasn't the normal run-of-the-mill sort of pop rocker, you know.